Welcome back to the class on international business communication. We have talked about different things in the past. We have talked about uh, communication in context. We have talked about the impact of context on communication. We have talked about um, how context plays a role in uh, deciding whether communication is effective or not. We have discussed uh, the, the role of the receiver's context in the interpretation of the message as effective or not. Today we will talk about persuasive communication, which is uh, more of uh, you know why people agree to do certain things. That is at the very basic level persuasive communication is knowing why people or uh, having people change uh, the way they do things or having them change from their current state to a different state. So, let us go on to revision first as usual. Uh, the first thing I would like you to discuss is what are the norms that can foster competent group interaction. I would like you to discuss how uh, what kinds of norms can be uh, can help the competent interaction uh, can facilitate competent interaction in any group or team. The second thing I would like you to discuss uh, is the different kinds of communication networks and the manner in which communication rules might be played out in different kinds of communication networks. We had talked about the different uh, communication networks. We had talked about uh, the uh, Y shaped network, we had talked about the wheel. So, we had talked about different kinds of networks, we had talked about clicks, we had talked about liaisons and bridges and I would like you to go back to all of that and figure out how rules might be differently played out, where would rules change and how would they change um, in these different kinds of networks. And uh, the next thing I would like you to discuss and revise is which professional roles would you associate uh, with uh, liaisons um, in the international business environment. Uh, again in the international business environment, what kinds of professional roles would be liaisons, what kinds of professional roles could be considered as liaisons and um, which kinds of professional roles might be considered as bridges and why do you think they are liaisons or bridges and who do you think are clicks? I mean the word click has a negative uh, connotation. So, I would like you to discuss uh, how these things are played out especially in international business what kind of uh, qualities would somebody who can be called a liaison need to have especially in the co uh, context of international business, especially in places where I will give you a hint in uh, situations where the languages between the interacting countries or the languages of the interacting countries are different. So, think about these things that is a hint and figure out how uh, what kinds of characteristics or uh, would liaisons need to have and which specific key people or key roles would need to be would could be called as liaisons. The next thing I would like you to discuss is how does cultural diversity affect friendships at work, how does it affect social relationships at work. Uh, and again when we say friendships and social relationships, I am also expecting you to discuss the stresses that are placed on teams and groups, the way friendships are formed, the way members are socialized all of that stuff and uh, the rules uh, that are played out and the manner in which communication rules are played out in these friendships and how does it affect superior subordinate relationships and the communication activities that go on between superiors and subordinates. Um, so, we had trust was one very important such activity feedback was another. How would cultural uh, diversity affect how trust is established? How, how, how would cultural diversity affect how feedback is given and received? And why do you think these things are affecting uh, cultural diversity is affecting or what in cultural diversity might be affecting the, uh, the rules in the uh, in these settings. Okay, let us move on to after you have done that then we will move on to uh, changing minds. Now, uh, what do you mean by a change of mind? The mind when we say change of mind what we are essentially talking about is the uh, how when we say the mind, the mind us uh, uses language to help people recreate internally 
the complexity of society when we are talking about mind and language and how language affects the mind and this was uh, proposed by George Herbert Mead a well known uh, anthropologist in 1934 and this has been mentioned in this book by uh, again I am sorry the name of the book is not by Ross and Anderson it is Anderson and Ross I have made that mistake in the past and I apologize for it. So this is this book questions of communication Anderson and Ross it is not Ross and Anderson here it is Anderson and Ross and I will make that correction for the future slides. Uh, is the disciplined set of programs or schemata, uh, mind is the uh, disciplined set of programs or schemata by which people organize their plans of action. Again this has been mentioned in this book, but we will not read the book, we will focus here. So um, um, again you know there is universities that are functioning on uh, what the mind is and what it can do, but um, at the very basic level. Uh, the brain operates in certain organized ways that may be described as programs and the actions of these programs uh, constitute the entity that we call the mind of a person. Life is guided by programs and programs are written in languages and that is really the connection. Let me explain this to you. What happens is that we say that the brain operates in certain organized ways. Now what we are essentially saying here is that the brain is functioning. Uh, based on the internal and external stimuli it has received and is processing, it is continuously processing those stimuli and it is organizing whatever it is processing. And uh, these, this organization, um, organization happens by way of programs. Every brain has a specific manner in which it organizes all this chaotic information. We all have our uh, unique ways in which we store this information. It is not stored as chaos. Imagine what would happen if uh, you had a, uh, an organization with a thousand people everybody was doing what they expected, uh, they were expected to do, but uh, they were not really uh, and you know everybody was trying to work towards uh, 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 making the organization work, but they were not really classified into different tasks. What would happen? Just take a field, I mean just you know somebody who is tilling a field. People are everybody is sort of digging into the field, but that can only go on for so long. After that you have to really specialize the tasks and give them special tasks and give the, at least demarcate their areas. So everybody knows what each one is responsible for and what specific task each one is supposed to do. And that is pretty much what the mind does. There are, there are ways according to which the mind organizes the information it gets. Uh, it puts all this information into different categories and, and that is how the mind works and uh, of course this is not a class on, on mind and behavior so we won't really go into it but that's that's pretty much the connection between the, the, uh, the brain and mind and programs and where, and how do we come up with these programs or how we how do we come up with these classifications we use language to identify these categories. We use uh, uh, whatever verbal, nonverbal um, images to class to categorize things, but we definitely have a name for each of these categories in our own minds and that name comes from a language which is a system of symbols. Again, so when we talk about persuasion, uh, we say human communication, uh, persuasion is human communication designed to influence others by modifying their beliefs, values or attitudes. And uh, persuasion according to the Oxford English Dictionary is the act of convincing a person by argument or inducement to do something or believe that something should be done. Now let us connect it to the mind. Let us connect it to what we were talking about earlier. Our brain has a certain set of programs. It has a manner, a specific manner in which it organizes things, a specific manner in which it organizes information, analyzes that information and stores that information. When we talk about persuasion, we are essentially talking about changing the way these programs work. We are essentially talking about uh, modifying the manner in which uh, the something in these programs you know you instead of going from A to B you go from A to C why do not you try that. So that is what we are essentially trying to do we are essentially trying to tell the targets that they should be moving from 
A to C instead of A to B and that is what persuasion is. You, you change the way or you, you initiate a change in the manner uh, in which the, the target person's brain processes and organizes and stores the information and that is persuasion you know at the very core. Okay, significance. Now, please discuss amongst yourselves how a knowledge of persuasive communication is helpful for a manage, manager in the international business environment. I just told you what persuasion is. I am not going to give you the answer to this. I would like you to come up with the answer to this yourselves. Uh, you can discuss something right now or you, you can start thinking about it and listen to what I have to say and discuss it at the end of the class, um, you know, according to whoever is coordinating this class at your end. Okay, some theoretical underpinnings of persuasive communication. Um, again, I am sorry to bore you, but then this is really essential and it will help you understand things at the conceptual level. Okay, classical rhetorical theory is the first one that we will talk about. Uh, this was given by uh, Aristotle many, many years ago in, in BCs, you know, it was I think 300 to four, uh, 400 to 300 BC. Uh, and uh, but when we say Aristotle 1954, we are not uh, talking about Aristotle himself having published these theories. These theories have been translated by people over the years and the, the translation that we are referring to was published in 1954 and that is what this, this uh, timeline is. Okay, rhetoric. Rhetoric is the faculty or ability to find the available means of persuasion in a situation and uh, that is essentially the our, our keenness to, to look for a means of persuasion in a situation, our ability to figure out that something that there is a, uh, there is something in this that can help me change my mind and that is uh, rhetoric and you or you take a situation and you find that there is something in that situation that can change a person's mind. And then you use that to change people's minds. So that is rhetoric. Classical rhetorical, rhetorical theory is uh, uh, suggests that language is used not just to influence others, but also to conduct internal dialogues for the purpose of solving problems. Our thoughts and our rhetoric are interdependent. So now let me explain this to you. This has been proposed by, um, again this is based on the theory by theories by Aristotle. What this essentially says is, now if there is a possibility of using some symbols to change somebody's minds, we use language to explore that possibility and to use that possibility to its maximum advantage. And according to the classical rhetorical theory, we say that language can not only be used to influence others, it can also be used to conduct a debate within ourselves so that we can explore different possibilities and we can change our own minds and we can solve problems and we can sort of weigh the alternatives using language in our own minds. And uh, again for somebody who is, uh, I know this is not a PhD class in communication theory, but you should start thinking about these things. What in language might be helping you influence your own intrapersonal communication? What among, what in the specific language that you use can be used to change other people's minds? We will go more into it, so I will explain this further. What according to this theory are thoughts and our rhetoric which means what we are thinking and what we find in uh, uh, what we are thinking or the persuasive elements of what we are thinking and what we are thinking are interrelated, they are interdependent. That is pretty much what the classical rhetorical theory says. Occasions for rhetoric, some uh, uh, opportunities where we can use rhetoric, one is deliberative rhetoric. It basically concerns itself with such questions as what do we do about X, which means that uh, when we stimulate a discussion, initially it is status quo, but when we, we point out that there is an opportunity for something to be done, people start thinking about it, people start uh, deliberating about it, people start discussing it and they actually end up changing, changing their minds. Everything is great. So let us. Um, take an example, uh, when we are trying to sell uh, say um, conflicts, 
So we say, okay, uh, the food I have is great, but what do we do about texture? Now, cornflakes at the nutritive level are very similar to a lot of things we normally use. We have different cereals, it's maize, you could actually boil the corn and have it for breakfast. You could do different things, but boiled corn and boiled wheat has similar textures. So whether you're eating porridge or boiled corn, it's just the soft gooey stuff in your mouth. But then when we are trying to sell cornflakes as an alternative breakfast cereal, we say, okay, great, it has the same kind of nutrition, but what do we do about the texture? Is there something different that we can come up with? And that gets people thinking and then they are convinced that yes, there is something different that needs to be done about the texture. So what do we do? We take this boiled corn, we process it, we pound it, we flatten it and make it crunchier. So people get a different texture and till we point that out, people are okay with what they have. This is a, an example of deliberative uh, rhetoric. Forensic rhetoric is what occurs in courtrooms and other places where the facts and interpretations of individual uh, cases are argued. So what we do is we argue on the basis of facts and interpretations. We take facts and we take uh, the interpretations of those facts and we argue upon the logic behind these interpretations and that is and use those interpretations and our own individual logics behind those interpretations to convince people based on facts that is forensic rhetoric. The third one here is <coughs> epideictic rhetoric. This refers to the ceremonial speaking in public forums that praises or blames individuals for their virtues or vices. What we are referring to here is exaggeration of a person's uh, personal qualities. So we use that to convince people. We just inflate things. We, we use flowery language. If you remember, we had talked about communication styles in a previous lecture and at that point we had talked about flowery language. And what epideictic rhetoric does is it uses flowery language, it uses exaggerations to convince people. You have something small and you enlarge it and you say, okay, uh, so and so took one bribe, so and so uh, uh, succumbed to a uh, to a bribe somebody went to this particular um, person's office and offered a bribe of say a thousand rupees which is not very much in this day and age and the person took it so this means that if some if if a person could succumb to or if a person could accept a bribe of 1000 what is preventing him from accepting a bribe of 5 lakhs tomorrow so this person should not be promoted to the higher rank because the opportunities for offering bribe should would be very large. So you sort of inflated or this person is very bad. How could this person accept a bribe? You know, a bribe is a bribe, whether it's one rupee or 1000 rupees or one lakh rupees, which is a hundred thousand rupees. How could this person accept a bribe and sort of, you know, you just let it all out or you say this person is very nice. This person has been known to be very, very uh, sincere and upfront. And it has been known that this person has been putting in um, has been standing up for what is right. This person has never succumbed to, to taking a bribe. Even when 5 lakh rupees were offered to him or 5 lakh means 500,000 rupees for our international audiences. I'm trying to clarify this. 500,000 rupees were offered to this person. The person did not take the bribe. So I'm using that. I'm just inflating this and I'm using that to convince people that this person is a very righteous, very upright kind of person. And that is epideictic rhetoric. I'm using an opportunity, praising a person for his or her virtue and doing it in public so people listen to me and agree with me. Okay. Inartistic and artistic persuasive appeals. We have different kinds of persuasive appeals. Inartistic means of persuasion um, are they emphasize the discovery of the facts of a given case that are largely external to the choices of the individuals concerned. They are simply found in the situation or in external inducements. For example, oaths and torture. Now, these are the more crude means of persuasion. You've taken an oath, so you have to do this. By virtue of this oath, you said you would speak the truth and always the truth and never lie or whatever. So you uh, use that oath and uh, pin everything onto that oath and that is the inartistic means of persuasion or you torture a person into saying something. 
artistic means of persuasion are more uh, of persuasion are more subtle facts must speak for themselves they must be interpreted and presented creatively in order for them to have an influence on an audience so you sort of creatively present facts and you say uh, you know these are the four or five facts and why don't you figure out for yourselves you organize the facts in such a manner that the listeners are propelled towards deciding in one direction you don't state the the uh, the um, uh, ultimate goal of persuasion up front you let the people use i mean you organize the facts in such a manner that the answer comes out of those facts on its own and that is the artistic means of persuasion so it's uh, sort of deliberately arranged facts and figures okay uh, some types of artistic proof uh, the first one here is ethos personal proof or ethical proof which acquires its value um, uh, sorry artistic proof is choices debtors make when they seek to persuade um, others uh, they are the choices they are the things they are the the concepts uh, rhetors when we say rhetors these are people who use rhetoric or persuasive communication so these are the choices they make or these are the 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 concepts they use to convince others to agree to what they are saying types of artistic proof we have ethos ethos is personal proof or ethical proof which acquires its value from the person who presents it which means it is more about uh, who is talking so it is proof about the person now this is of various types and it depends upon the credibility of the speaker the speaker's reputation which in turn depends upon the uh, the the uh, environment that the speaker is in expertise of the speaker trustworthiness and dynamism auditors admire rhetors who have enthusiastic and animated presentation styles whatever the case may be the interpretation lies in the hands of the receiver here when we say auditors we are not talking about people who go and audit companies we are talking about people who are listening to you and when we say auditors here auditors admire rhetors people who are listening admire people who speak with a lot of energy so uh, you know the, the how would you feel if i was sitting here and i was just reading here artistic proof choices writers make when they seek to persuade others types of artistic proof ethos personal proof or ethical proof acquires its value from the person who presents it how do you feel about this nothing but when i actually look at you i move my hands i move my neck i do this i sort of move my torso and the energy is reflected i my voice goes up and down you tend to pay more attention and this is what dynamism is and people who are listening tend to respond better to to the speakers who exude energy who throw out energy into the audience okay credibility of course we know speaker's reputation expertise again uh, you indicate your expertise um, uh, either by telling people that you are an expert or by discussing things that seem logical to the person and trustworthiness of course um, it can't be built in one day it comes with time but then that also influences the ethos of any um, appeal any persuasive appeal so um, that contributes to the personal proof i have been trained in such and such thing uh, i have a reputation for being uh, for saying the right thing and for admitting my mistakes um i'm trustworthy you can believe what i'm saying you can believe uh, uh, that whatever i'm telling you is really the way it should be and i'm saying it with a lot of fervor and so that contributes to your belief in me because of my personality and that is ethos okay the second type of artistic proof here is pathos uh some people call it pathos i'm sorry if i'm mispronouncing it um pathos refers or pathos refers to the rhetorical use of messages that appeal to an audience's emotions and passion people believe what they want to believe what they feel like believing now this is the other thing again we are we are again going round about round and round uh, you know everything is around the person's context you will believe what you want to believe i don't believe that uh, child abuse is a big problem 
I don't want to believe that it can happen to anyone in my vicinity. Okay. Now, if God forbid something like this happens, and I'm sorry about, you know, sorry for hurting the sentiments of the atheists, but uh, we don't want such things to happen. We hear about it and we sort of shut our, uh, clo- shut our eyes to it. Or we say uh, uh, unethical academic practices don't take place in institutions of higher education. We just don't want to believe that it can happen. And so, if somebody tells us, we'll say, no, 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 it doesn't happen. We don't have bad students. We don't have bad students at IIT. I'm not saying it happens. I'm just saying that we just close our, uh, we shut our eyes to possibilities like this. And uh, that is pathos. On the other hand, uh, that is the negative side. On the other hand, if somebody says that uh, all students at IIT are brilliant, I will believe it without batting an eyelid. All faculty are brilliant. Um, all faculty at IIT Kharagpur are hardworking. They produce large volumes of research. All the students at IIT Kharagpur are uh, brilliant. So. As a faculty at IIT Kharagpur, I will believe it because I am part of the system and I know what happens here. And even if I am outside these four walls, just because of the reputation of IIT, I will believe it without batting an eyelid. I am like, yeah, it is IIT Kharagpur, it has to be true. So I will believe what I want to believe. And that is, it. you sort of appeal to people's emotions and passion. Yes, we believe that if it is uh, an institute like IIT, it has to be this good. Okay, misconceptions about the role of emotions in persuasive communication. Um, Some things that we believe that uh, or don't uh, sort of some things, some uh, misconceptions are one is emotions are not things that can be stored up or expended like commodities. We think that emotions are things, but they are really not things. They can be uh, stored up or expended like commodities. They are better understood as judgments and interpretations unique to each individual that develop as a result of a complex interplay of psychological and physiological factors. Now, what is this? This means that emotions are interpretations. My emotions are my interpretations of how comfortable what something is and how comfortable I feel in that situation. So, they are unique to each individual and when we say mass emotion that is unfortunately a misconception, but then we use it, it is used to to the advantage of people who are trying to persuade people. Uh, The other thing here is people believe that emotions come largely from outside the self, they are inner interpretations effectively tied to outer experiences that is the emotions in relation to something else outside the self. I feel what I want to feel. We were talking about disqualification the other day. Disqualification is, I will not feel what you want me to feel. I will not react the manner in which you want me to react. I will not interpret the message in the manner that you want me to interpret it. I will interpret it the way I want to interpret it. You are trying to hurt my feelings. You are trying to get me angry. I won't get angry. I will not let it affect me negatively. So, that is disqualification. This is pretty much what we are saying here. Emotions come largely from outside. We say, okay, our emotions, what I feel is tied to something outside. No, it is tied to what I want to believe about whatever is happening outside. If I do not want to let whatever is happening outside affect me, then I will not be affected by it. And emotions are physiological and psychological. I mean, they're a combination of physiology and psychology. So these are this is something, and these are some of the misconceptions that are used and at times abused by people who want to persuade others for various reasons to buy things, to vote, to all kinds of things. Okay, the third type of artistic proof is logos. Logos means that persuasion should be based on logical arguments and reasons that a rhetor can present to an audience. Information that is presented in a precise order and accompanied by statistical support, examples and relevant testimony encourages listeners to arrive at a specific conclusion recommended by the rhetor. So, this is what we say is the right way of doing things. This is logic. If A causes B and B causes C, I should be able to assume that A causes C and that is logic. I am going to give you some facts that are so clearly linked to each other that you will arrive at the conclusion that I want you to arrive at. So, that is logos. Ethos, which means I believe you because 
you are believable not because of whatever you're saying anything you say is acceptable because i believe you as a person pathos is i believe what you are saying i feel for what you're saying i believe in whatever i want to believe in so whatever you're saying appeals to my emotions and that is why i'll believe in it and logos means that whatever you're saying ties in with my logical thinking i understand the logic you are portraying to me so i'm going to believe in whatever you are saying that is the some of the uh, the three facets of artistic proof that persuasive speakers use to convince others now uh, some types here uh, syllogism is the, is the form of logical reasoning that moves from major premise through minor premise to conclusion and this is the uh, inductive reasoning similar to inductive reasoning for example a has a characteristic feature x b is a subset of a hence b will also have the characteristic feature x so we'll say uh, all horses can run fast uh, uh, black is a horse and so black can also run fast and so that is the uh, syllogism we go from a larger subset to a smaller specific detail the th- the second one here is enthymemes one of the two premises is implicit for example a has a characteristic feature x this characteristic feature x manifests itself in some form in b hence the listeners assume that b must be a subset of a in order for it to be exhibiting characteristic x now what are we saying here we say that again taking the previous example all horses can run fast black can also run fast so we assume we let it for we let the 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 listeners decide that yes b must be a horse and that is why you know b can run fast so b also must be a horse we say all horses can run fast b can run very fast so you sort of leave one of the assumptions for the listeners to figure out and that is enthymeme and that is one more way of using logic to persuade people interpersonal tradition we were talking about the classical rhetorical tradition of persuasion interpersonal tradition of persuasion is where we use persuasion as a helping relationship where we say that persuasion actually happens uh, because of the communication because of the interactions between the two people it's not because of what we think or what we feel or because of the way in which our mind impacts uh, what we feel about things it's not intrapersonal classical tradition typically focuses on the intrapersonal nature of persuasion i am doing whatever you know i am behaving according to the stimuli that are coming to me from the environment but it is after all the most of the processing happens internally here we take the processing outside of ourselves and we say it is the interpersonal tradition of persuasion how you know uh, interpersonally we can convince people to uh, believe in whatever we are saying or to agree with our requests so the first point here is persuasion as a helping relationship some implications for health communication we need to communicate with people interpersonally if possible not at them impersonally again most of the research in this direction has been uh, carried out in health communication where doctors were trying to convince patients uh, to take their medicines on time and uh, patients were not agreeing to it and then the doctors eventually uh, said that you know they realized that they shouldn't be telling patients what to do they should be convincing patients to take their medication on time to to undergo treatment on time to undergo treatment in the manner that they were supposed to undergo treatment in and uh, so they don't tell them what to do they convince them they say this is why you should be doing this uh, do your resources allow you to do something like uh, something uh, in this direction if not i can suggest alternative courses of action so it's sort of uh, constructed together the convincing portion is constructed together by constant feedback from both the directions and that is how persuasion becomes a helping relationship 
some characteristics of personal occasions for persuasion. Uh, the first one here is existence of a relational history. We more readily take into account details from our past encounters with the other person. If I have had a, a history of interacting with the other person, I am more likely to believe them. I have had some interaction, I have been convinced, I have managed to convince the other person at times. So, it will be easier for me to be convinced uh, because of whatever we are talking about and there is some relational history. Opportunities for interaction, we can more easily adjust our approaches while we are applying them because we are aware of the other person's ongoing reactions. This is, uh, uh, here we are talking about the uh, constant feedback we are getting from the person we are talking to. If we are in touch, if we are having an ongoing interaction with the person, it becomes easier for us to help the person to convince the person. For example, I am trying to convince you through a virtual medium. I am not able to tell you all these things in person. You are not here. I do not know when you will be listening to these lectures. Could be 6 months from now, could be a year from now, could be 20 years from now. And so, I do not have an opportunity to convince you that whatever I am saying is right. In addition, I do not have an opportunity to make any corrections to something I may inadvertently say incorrectly. And uh, that is the difference between real time and uh, virtual communication and even persuasion. I am trying to tell you that all these things make sense to me. They may not be making sense to you, but I have no way of convincing you. If you were here in class, you could have asked me questions, but ma'am, how does this play out? But ma'am, how does that play out? But we do not have that opportunity. So, it is one sided. When we say we are trying to convince a person personally or persuade a person personally, we say that the opportunities for interaction, the number of times I can talk to you, I can get feedback from you, rephrase whatever I am saying will determine how well I can convince you. Excuse me. The concern for relational outcomes, writers in personal relationships attempt to influence the other while being fully aware of how much the attempt could change the relationship itself. Now, again, when we are talking to somebody, uh, you know, many times we say when you are fighting with somebody, you should after a point, you should let the argument go. Why do we say that? Because after a point, the argument starts changing the relationship and you say, okay, this is what I am saying. What I am saying is right and the other person says, what I am saying is right and you both are stuck on your own points and then uh, there is some, some sort of disconfirmation from either side starts and you say, you know what, I do not want to talk to you. And when the other person says this, immediately one feels, oh my God, am I going to lose my relationship with this person? Am I going to lose my friendship with this person? Is my boss going to be offended? Is my boss not going to start treating me? Is my boss going to stop treating me well? And the person says, you know what, I have had it. I do not want to, this to continue. And uh, at that point, uh, the relationship becomes more important and the manner in which we try and persuade people changes. Now, when we are together with somebody, how we help the person is determined to a large extent by what we think of that relationship with the person and what we think of the outcome of this persuasion in terms of the relationship we have with that person. And that is what this is all about, the concern for relational outcomes. How will this communication affect the relationship I have with this person? Okay, compliance, we were talking persuasion and compliance are interrelated, so we will just discuss the difference. What is compliance? Compliance occurs when one person, uh, I am sorry, let us focus on the slide. Compliance occurs when one person does what another person wants done to achieve a favorable reaction from the other. He may be interested in attaining certain specific rewards or in avoiding certain specific punishments that the influencing agent controls. This is by Kelman, 1966 in Anderson and Ross. I just love this book. I have been referring to this book uh, again and again. So, what uh, we are essentially saying here is compliance is a form of persuasion in which one person does what another person wants done. You say do this and I say okay, that is compliance. I comply with your request. I comply with, I 
of course, follow your orders, but I comply with your request. He may be interested in attaining certain specific rewards or in avoiding certain specific punishments that the influencing agent controls. Why do I comply with reward? Why do I comply with a request you make? Maybe there is some gain at the end of it. In terms of a relationship, our relationship will be closer. You will think of me as a nice person. If you are my boss, you will say, okay, he or she is she's ob obedient. Uh, or if I do not listen to what you say, there is a stick at the end of it. I will be punished if I do not comply with this request. Okay, persuasion. Persuasion is compliance plus identification plus internalization. So, we just discussed compliance. Identification is people change behavior and attitudes to conform not only publicly, but also privately in order to identify with the persuader in certain way. Internalization is person is influenced and conforms because he or she perceives deeper congruence between personal values and the behavior suggested. So, compliance is just one part of it. Yes, I agree to doing things, but why do I agree to doing those things? I agree to doing those things because something here, something here in my heart is convinced that something, something changes. We were talking about programs for organizing information uh, in the beginning of this uh, lecture and something sort of clicks either uh, in my heart or in my mind uh, that you know something is right about the situation. I convince myself that something is right and then it may not always be like that. We will talk about negative persuasion at some point also. But what we are essentially trying to say is that uh, uh, there is identification, we change behaviors and attitudes uh, in public and also we do it in private. You know, after that public situation is over, I still try and convince myself that yes, this is the right thing to do. And um, I perceive a deeper congruence, I perceive a harmony, I perceive a link between what you are suggesting and what I am doing and that is why I change my behavior and that is when persuasion is complete, when I have internalized the reason for change and those programs in my brain have changed, the programs that process the information have changed. Okay. <coughs> Compliance gaining theory proposed by Maxwell and Schmidt in 1967, uh, again uh, published in Anderson and Ross in 2002. Uh, the basic ways in which we try to persuade others interpersonally are promise, we promise to reward others if they comply. This is pretty self explanatory, so I will just read it. Uh, threat, we promise to punish others if they do not comply. Positive expertise, we suggest that we know that good things will happen if they comply. Negative expertise, we suggest that we know that bad things will happen if they do not comply. So, I know again positive expertise and negative expertise is I know I am an expert, I know enough about this to know that positive or negative things will happen. Liking we act so as to be pleasant, helping them decide to comply with someone they like. Pre giving is we give a reward before suggesting that they comply. Uh, again um, something an example of this could be a bribe. Uh, I am giving you all this, so there is a sense of obligation, we will come to it in a uh, few minutes. Aversive stimulation is we continually punish them, uh, so their compliance will bring, bring relief and debt is we suggest that they owe us compliance because of some previous situations. I scratched your back a million years ago, so you have to help me now. Uh, aversive stimulation is you constantly get put them into uh, very difficult situations, you keep sort of hammering at them and then they finally give in and they say I have had enough of this negativity and they give in. Okay. Uh, some more here moral appeal, we say that they will be immoral if they do not comply or more moral if they do. Positive self feeling is we show how they will feel better about themselves if they comply. So, you will feel good if you um, agree to doing this. Uh, negative self feeling, moral appeal and th there are differences here. Moral appeal is uh, this is good, this is right and that is why you should be doing this. Positive self feeling is you will feel good about this. Would not you feel good if you help a child in need? Yes, it is right, but will you also not feel good about it? Will you also not feel good if you uh, invite these disadvantaged children to your home once a month and give them some food? Negative self feeling is we show how they will feel worse about themselves if they do not comply. 
he will say, how will you live with yourself if you do not uh, help these children? How do you live with yourself? You drive past this, uh, this uh, uh, slum every day. How do you live with yourself? Your kids are sitting there and throwing food on the floor and look at these children. They do not have two square meals in a day. So, how do you live with yourself? That is negative feeling. Positive alter casting, we suggest that good people would wish to comply. Uh, altruism, we claim that we very much need the compliance. Altruism is helping people, going out and helping people in need. And we say, I really need your help. I cannot do without your help. I cannot function without your help. So, I appeal to your inner need to be helpful. Positive esteem, we show how others will think well of them if they comply and negative esteem, uh, we show how others will think worse of them if they do not comply. So, we do this with people who, who, uh, who are very much concerned about what others will think of them, whether it is right or wrong is different, but what will people in your clique think about you, what will people in your this close network think about you if you do not do this. Now, many of these things are overlapping and Maxwell and Schmidt realized that. So, they came up with some categories uh, and I let you figure out which of these go into the rewarding activity, <coughs> which of these go into punishing activities, which of these go into expertise, um, activation of impersonal commitments and activation of personal commitments. That is your homework, figure out how these connect, but these are 5 categories into which the previous 16 points go into. Okay. Why do people comply with requests? Okay. The first one is how do we persuade people? We persuade people by these different methods. Why do people agree to being persuaded? And that is what we will talk about. The first one here is adaptation level theory, which was proposed by Petty and uh, Kachiopo. I hope I am pronouncing the name right in 1981. It has been published uh, or it has been mentioned in this book by Canary, Cody and Manushoff. I will show you this book, another book that I have been referring to quite a bit. Uh, this is the, the, the book that I have been referring to, Interpersonal Communication, second edition uh, by Canary, Daniel J. Canary, Michael J. Cody and Valerie L. Manushoff. And again, I am sure later editions of this book are available if you can find them. Uh, please go through uh, this book. It is very, very helpful for understanding interpersonal communication. Okay. Why do people comply with requests? Um, adaptation level theory is when people choose an amount of something, tangible or intangible feelings or, or physical things and come to expect that amount as typical or normative. We say they have adapted to that level. So, to give you an example, we say that, okay, uh, you know, black, I mean, I may be fond of very bright colors, but I see everybody around me wearing this, this black color. So, I say black is a very professional color and uh, uh, in relation to black, I feel that say the color of this bottle uh, is uh, very, very bright. And so, if I wore clothes of this color, you would think that, you know, I am uh, being very unprofessional. And so, um, and that is again as compared to black. Maybe I used to wear clothes of that color at some point, but after I come to believe that black is my color, then everything else is compared to black. And that is one example. Uh, anchor, again two types of adaptations we make. We either anchor things or we um, we believe things due to the anchor effect or we, we can help people comply or we, we comply with re requests due to the contrast effect. Anchor effect is an expectation can become an anchor for how someone perceives what is normative or typical. For example, the definition of professionalism or what is appropriate office wear in business environment. Now, I am at an institute where we are usually casually dressed. We focus more on what we teach and how we teach than how we are dressed. So, you know, once in a while it is a sari, once in a while it is jeans, once in a while it is this or that. I mean, but we focus less, a lot less on how we dress up and go to the office. So, somebody who is coming from a multinational company to this place will say, oh my God, you see teachers in jeans? And we say, no, you know, what I say in class is much more important than the color of my clothes in class. But then again, uh, this is, you are comparing everything to whatever you have seen. So, these definitions are socially constructed and 
I believe I say okay black is professional so somebody who is dressed in black will be considered more professional than uh, the person who is not dressed in black and um, contrast effect is you say I will not be like this I, I do not want to be like this. So, you sort of up make an appeal to the contrary when some new object person or event is judged against the standard and is displaced away from the adapted level or anchor that is the contrast effect there are relative perceptions of what is better or worse in comparison to the standard. For example, driving to work in a car is better than driving to work on a two wheeler or taking the public transport and you say you know what uh, when you are trying to sell a car to an executive you say you were using a scooter but that time you were at a much lower level. Now, look at everybody else. So, there is a contrast effect you do not fit into this category you must do something different to be recognized as somebody different. So, uh, you know the, the, again taking the example of these clothes if you are trying to sell bright clothes to professionals you say everybody wears black you know right from frontline managers to mid level executives everybody wears black, but you are above and beyond all that why cannot you dress up in, in simpler in brighter colors you have crossed that. So, there is a contrast effect and you try and convince people when you are talking about anchoring you say you fit into this category everybody in this category is doing this. So, you must also do this and that is appeal by similarity here appeal by dissimilarity that is pretty much what these things are impact of anchors and contrasts um, anchors um, lead to expectations that are governed by perceptions it is useful and I will let you figure this out I am giving you lots of tests today uh, which industry would this be useful in this would be useful in the dash industry or dash division of any business you fill these blanks in you create a perception that leads to expectations which in turn leads to needs which helps the business by doing something that you will be doing and I want you to fill in these blanks and figure out what I am talking about and you know you know this will help you gain entry into or get a perspective about the industry that uses persuasion as its base. Uh, contrast uh, persons generosity can be manipulated by comparing his or her contribution to others persuasion by contrast can also be used for manipulation in sales pitches by pitching more expensive products before the less expensive ones and what happens is when we talk about generosity you are asking people for funds you will say uh, so and so has bought a phone worth uh, or so and so has contributed uh, you know we are all contributing 1000 rupees so why do not you go ahead and contribute 1000 rupees also that is the minimum we expect from you and uh, so that is something that you uh, do and and you say that if you contribute less than that would not you be considered less uh, generous than others. Uh, then another situation that has been given in this book is uh, persuasion by contrast can be used for manipulation in sales pitches. So, you show somebody this very expensive model of a telephone and you say um, ok you know this is there and then uh, you show them a less expensive model which is still beyond your range, but you say you know what this is cheaper. So, this is what pretty much sales do they will first uh, put very high prices on things and then they will say 40 percent off and so even with 40 percent off it is still out of your reach if you had gone to buy that product at that price originally you would not have probably bought it, but at that point you say ok it is fine you know it is at least cheaper. So, creating wrong perceptions um, reciprocity is another reason why people comply with requests you scratch my back and I will scratch yours one should be more willing to comply with a request from someone who has previously provided a favor or concession. Uh, self explanatory this creates an obligation there could be reciprocal concessions also uh, we feel obligated to comply with the request if the asker has made a concession to us in the past they say I have given you this much discount I have I have done this for you. So, why do not you? Um, come back or we are obligated to somebody because of some social um, issue or some social requirement. So, that is why we comply with requests. Now, uh, one implication of this is the door in the face tactic. Uh, people say no to the first request and the door is shut in the solicitor's face after rejection and the solicitor concedes you prompt the target to concede. So, what you do is you you make the first request is very large 
and when you're going for sales and all you say okay please agree to buy this at at 7000 rupees and you say what nonsense 7000 rupees for this particular vacuum cleaner and i can get a similar one at 5000 so they shut the door in your face and then you knock again and you say okay if they are selling it to you for 5000 rupees i'll sell you this this particular model for for 4500 rupees and you say hmm that is something that is worth considering so so and plus they'll perceive that you have jumped you have come down by uh, 2500 rupees and you'll say my god you're going to make that concession you're going to bring your cost down by by 1/3 so that i can buy this product and you say yes i'll do that for you you're such an important customer and then they're like okay if you're willing to come down one third maybe i'll consider your request so you've got what you wanted as opposed to you knocking on their door and saying you know what i'm selling this for 4500 rupees will you buy it and they'll say what nonsense the other brand is more popular it is more branded i don't mind spending another 500 rupees for such an uh, such a well known company but when you bring your price down you say we are better than them why don't you try it give us a chance we'll give we'll offer it to you at a price that is 500 rupees less than them so you stand to gain and if you like it you can buy some more so that is what you do uh, okay some guidelines in the effective use of the door and the face tactic the first one here would be rejection of the first request by the target person perception that the second request is smaller than the first one and the solicitor is conceding to a smaller request again so you the first request should be rejected the second request should be clearly smaller than the first one and the solicitor it should be clear to the person who to the target person that the solicitor is actually doing this by taking a hit himself perception that the first request is not preposterous what that means that the target person should have a reason for denying it and shouldn't read too much into its size for example if you're trying to sell something for say 5000 rupees and you ask 15000 rupees for it and the person you are targeting clearly knows that it's not worth 15000 rupees so they shut the door in your face and they're like why is the person offering it to me for 15000 rupees what is going on so they start reading too much into it and that is not uh, good so uh that is that is making a preposterous request you don't want people reading too much into whatever you are offering um reasonable size of the first request so as to not evoke resentment or result in loss of credibility of the solicitor again it should not be too big so that people stop believing you uh it should not evoke a negative response and you know you shouldn't ask say if you're trying to sell something for 4500 rupees you shouldn't try and sell it for 10000 rupees and you'll say the person will say are you kidding me are you out of your mind i don't believe you or whatever you know how could a person with your caliber think of this so or solicitation of the uh first and second request needs to be done by the same solicitor because people see you people see your body language and the focus is on the person how much is this person willing to come down from here that is all we have uh, time for today i will just take you to the questions i have some more stuff for you but we will talk about it in the next class i would like you to discuss the uh, what we have for your homework uh, discuss persuasion motivation compliance and change of mind and the interplay among these in the context of international business please discuss amongst yourselves how diversity would impact the reasons why people comply with requests and discuss the ethical implications of the tactics used to convince people to comply with requests and we'll talk about the rest next time thank you